Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production. Look at that view. That's lovely. The yellow rapeseed for miles. This, what's this? Is this barley just starting to, uh, just starting to grow here? There's lots of Mally's trees. <laughs> Mally's, Mally's mention. I'm going to call it Mally's mention at the start of each show now. I just can't help myself, can I? But uh, yeah, look at this view. That's where we're going for lunch, Barney. Just over there. Look, over there. Past the monk jacks. Yes, I know you're looking at those. But uh, he's very funny today. He's not really eating. He didn't eat breakfast. He gets a bit anxious in the mornings. He sort of follows me. Where are we going? Where are we going? What are we doing? Don't leave me. Don't forget me. Yesterday I went on a commercial shoot and uh, I couldn't take him with me because it was uh, heavy plant machinery clearing, clearing away um, about three, four acres of land I was photographing. That's not very romantic, Neil. No, I, I can photograph other things, you know. Um, so he couldn't come with me and he was, he was just, he sulked with me. So this morning he followed me. He was right on my heel <laughs> from the moment I woke up to make sure that uh, I wasn't going to forget him. So, so we're here. That's where we're having lunch, Barney, over there. It is. Let me get a picture so that you know, put, put the letters down for a second, so that you know where, where I'm walking today or where we're walking today, because once again, Sir Barcalot is out uh, with us on the action. Let's get a picture of the valley. Now I've started the show twice today. Here we go, another one of those. Little sketchbook image so you can see where I'm walking. I'll put my pictures on the show page as, as always, near to bottom. I know my place, but uh, I've started, yes, I've started this show twice today. <laughs> the first time was a, an unmitigated disaster as I tried to talk about the so sound of silence and Barney found himself a horse to bark at that came out of nowhere. Um, so uh, I don't know, I'm, I may include a section of that as an outtake at the end of the show, but uh, I feel we should have some kind of fanfare for it being number 300 today we're at 300 300th episode not the 300th photo walk they kind of came along they sort of grew uh, organically as we as we went along didn't they but 300 editions thank you really for being there for joining me on this uh, and it's an overused word or cliche i know but uh, on this journey that we should even reach the number 300 especially since in the the world of podcast if you get to number seven you're considered uh, a podcaster but we're not really doing anything too special apart from the fact uh, you and i and barney are out on this photo walk but uh, if we get to 500 which i sincerely hope we will with your help um we'll do the show from i don't know copenhagen or paris your place actually your place yeah can we go to your place for that show but uh, yeah, thank you. You, my friend, get me thinking in a way that prior to compiling or curating this podcast, I'm not sure I was doing in my life, or perhaps not quite so consciously when it, when it came to thinking about photography. I mean, I did plenty of photography, of course, but thinking about it. And that's really come about through curating your letters, your amazing thoughts, and trying to weave them into this story each week. Neil, stop now. You're dangerously close to sounding like you're taking yourself way too seriously, as Alex Soth said a few weeks back. I should make a meme of that, shouldn't I? I mean, I take myself way, way, way too seriously. See, there we go. The magic of post-production. But you do, you get me thinking. And I love the mix of letters from those who've now become friends, I think. The sort of friends we could probably meet in the after-show coffee and Garibaldi bar, couldn't we? Oh, there would be a... There's an idea... That's my kind of bar. And of course, those who've reached out for the first time, it's a joy to hear from you. If you've uh, never contacted the show before and you've thought, oh, I'm, I, might, I might just pen a letter, send it in, see what happens. And uh, those who've become familiar names, <laughs> such as Mally and uh, Bob Demers, who is um, a name you're probably becoming more familiar with now. Good old Bob, less of the, less of the old Neil, sorry, Bob, uh, out in Tucson. That wonderful part of America, which um, I am sincerely thinking that would make a great photographic retreat. But anyway, that's for another day's discussion. He wrote a comment on the show page following last week's show where we talked together about the sound of walking and the sound of silence. 
And in particular, I was talking about uh, the Norwegian mountains and how in the quiet of that place I could, I could practically hear my tinnitus composing music. Which sounds odd, but that's exactly what it's like. Anyway, Bob wrote a letter and he said, I remember the first time I ever heard silence. We just wrapped a video shoot in Palm Springs in California. Oh, get you, that sounds very glamorous. And Tommy, our sound mixer, and I decided to kill a couple of hours hiking in the foothills that frame the city. We bushwhacked up a small cactus-strewn hill, finally connecting with a dirt trail that would lead us back to the parking lot. We stopped for a, a sip of water, and there it was, in the stillness of the heights, that cotton in your ears, deafening silence. You could hear the blood rushing through your veins, and that uh, first hint of tinnitus too, Neil. Um, I looked at Tommy, he looked at me, and without a word, we both broke into a giddy laughter at the thought of this shared first. I can tell you it was extra special experiencing this with Tommy, a professional listener, if you will, who found it extremely profound. Hence, I've heard that wall of silence many times in the mountains around Tucson. It's an elixir that intensely grounds one's being in the environment. Oh, Bob. Thank you for, for that comment following last week's show. Um, that scene that I was talking about where I stopped to make a picture in the complete silence of that, uh, what was a ski slope in Norway? Nobody else had been on it. You can see by the picture that's on the show page today, so if it looks a bit random that I have a, a picture of a, a, a slope on a mountain that was taken, incidentally, just a month before the pandemic shut us all down in, well, in our part of the world anyway. But you'll see that picture, that intense... Well, hopefully you can hear the silence, the quiet uh, within it. I'll, I've popped it on the show page. And, and talking of quiet, I think it links to my two guests today so well. The photographer who, who set the assignment at the head of the week, Jason Florio, I uh, promised he'd return, and, and he has. Uh, he's returned to talk about making photo projects and telling stories, and, and one in particular, I thought it might be quite nice to start talking to photographers about particular assignments. And so with, with that in mind, um, I'm going to talk to him about uh, one that's been spied in, in the Guardian newspaper, where Jason made the pictures. He spent time in the mangroves in the Gambia photographing uh, what they call the oyster ladies, where the quiet and, and still was for him a very real part of the experience. Today on The Photo Walk. I, it's just idyllic out there. It's just so peaceful. Sound of the birds and it's just the sound of the paddles and then just the chipping of the, the oysters off the mangroves and the ladies are singing and calling to each other. It, it's, 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 you know, probably hasn't changed in hundreds of years the way they're doing it. And then Ronald Turnbull, who knows exactly what the sound of stillness is, as he takes his bivy bag. Essentially, it's a... I suppose it's a, it's a sleeping bag that you take into the hills and the mountains with a minimum of supplies, maybe a clothes change, and a camera, and enjoys the peace and tranquility brought about by, by being in nature, enveloped in every sundown and sunrise. It's just, it's just very nice to be on top of a mountain, especially if you're fairly fit. Yeah clambering over the rocks and having the rain falling in your hair and seeing the great views or just looking at the inside of the cloud like I was on Monday. Stories of life told by photographers and today those stories come from Jason Florio and Ronald Turnbull and you. It's a unique, special kind of photography podcast made from the letters you send in, the thoughts that you have and words from our special inspirational guests. Whatever you photograph with, be it a, a much coveted Leica, something or other, or a humble smartphone. This isn't a show that will make you feel uncomfortable if you can't calculate f-stops. It's about the emotion and the wonder of making a photo. And in that 6.6 .6 billion people on this planet can make a picture with something, there's a lot of us to walk with on the photo walk today. In the mailbag then, does documentary photography actually impact the world? Does it make people change opinion? Does it make leaders change their own focus? Our relationship with trees, the movies that made or, or make me cry, accidental messaging, a pictorial homage to Ukraine and an unusual room at 10,000 feet. So shall we walk then? 
checklist out. Coffee and Garibaldi's packed. Check. Boots on and laced. Check. Walking trousers or shorts. Check. Spare batteries. Check. Fillmore cards. Check. Earbuds in. Check. Lens caps off. Let's walk. I've escaped to, to some woodland because the wind is uh, has really got up. It uh, wasn't supposed to be like this this morning. We were promised five mile an hour gentle breezes. Not at all like that. So uh, yeah, that's it. Makes it always very hard when you're trying to record a podcast when the when the wind is blowing a hoolie, as we say, in our house. I'm not quite sure if I'm supposed to be in this wood. There was a sign earlier, one of those, get off my land, go away. And it was in big red letters as well. Very serious when people write in red, isn't it? But I think this bit we're okay with. What do you think, Barney? Uh, you don't know either, do you, really? So, uh, so guess what camera I'm using today? Oh, I don't know, Neil. A pinhole carved from the inside of a dead oak. That's a very creative idea, but uh, no, entirely wrong. I will award you several points though for ingenuity though. No, it's not a it's not a pinhole, it's the X100V, which I I know many are fans of as we walk together. And guess where I bought it from? Oh, I know this one, Neil. Hand up, hand up. Was it from mpb.com, the number one people to go to for buying and selling and trading used camera kit online in the UK, the US and Europe? Oh, you are so sharp. Yes, the X100V that I'm using comes from mpb.com, a company that so oh, so generously show their faith and support in this project of ours. These walks that we make together, making our photographic imprint, large or small, our, our legacies. So uh, yes, thank you, mpb.com, because they help photographers like me and like you to tell our stories with kit that doesn't cost the the earth, everything from digital cameras to lenses to bags to sound kit, the, the stuff of creativity, the stuff that some people stopped using that's perfectly good, that's in excellent condition, that now is in the hand of, well, another photographers so that they can go and make their, their special stories. And of course, with sustainability being ever more important, you'll also be part of the circular economy by using mpb.com. Oh, that's nice. Can you hear that? The birds, bit of bird song. The wind's died down a bit. Much, much better. Let's go this way though, Barney, because I think I can see a farm. And if we're on Get Off My Land, we'll be in trouble. Come on, this way. Right, first letter. This is the, um, I think it's fair to say one of the longest letters and replies ever on this show, but it's such an important topic. Um, that I, I wanted to, to share it with you. And we're starting with, uh, I suppose, a very sobering letter in many ways from Chris Leyland. And uh, Chris, with the uh, benefit of reading your letter and taking some time to sit down and ruminate and think about your, your words and your question that's about to come, I've, I've pieced together, well, I've tried to unpick what I think about the topic, but um, I'm sure there are many other things to be said about it this is a topic that we could probably cover across one, two, three weeks, a month even, as a topic in itself. So if you have anything to add to this discussion, and I'm sure you will, then please send them uh, your letters to studio at photographydaily.show. Studio at photographydaily.show. Hi, Neil, writes Chris. Thanks for the podcast. I really do look forward to listening to it on Friday, Saturdays for the more. Oh, thank you, Chris. You're one of our patrons, of course, and Mondays, even though I haven't yet taken part in an assignment. Well, it's not a problem. You can, um, you can take part whenever you want. My question or discussion is, do photographs, documentary photographs, actually make a difference? I don't want to sound too depressive, but do documentary photography projects actually help the people in the pictures? I mean, Don McCullen has photographed war, conflict and tragedy. But it still goes on. Carol Guzzi is now in Ukraine. Lindsay Adario, same as Carol. But have their photographs made a difference? I feel like they're banging their heads against a brick wall, showing the truth and the worst of humanity. Jim Mortram's English political and socio project, Small Town Inertia, is an unbelievable body of work. But how much has the people's lives in this book changed for the better? 
I know that David received a scanner that read his books to him to aid his blindness, but the wider problem, has that been addressed? I truly believe these stories need to be told, but does anything actually change? Have the pictures of suffering coming out of Ukraine, Palestine, Africa, South America, and the world actually move governments to change their way of thinking and acting? Or does it just look bad if they aren't seen to be doing something about it? Is it the pictures? From Chris. Well, Chris, where to start? Because, uh, as I say, this is a debate for a complete show or series of shows. And uh, I do wish somebody like Don McCullin or indeed James Nakway were able to share their thoughts with me. But um, I've, I've attempted an answer. And I dearly hope if you're listening to this and have something to add of value, which I'm sure you will, then you'll take the time to write to the, uh, the email address that I gave you. So um, some considerations. I wrote down some questions, actually, and I kind of worked my answer back from the questions. Has photography ever stopped something happening in this case war? That was a question I asked myself. Has photography brought about justice? Has photography uh, made a difference in a positive sense uh, to those that have been impacted by something dreadful? What did photography actually do for them? And does photography bring about change in the, in the corridors of so-called power? So, first of all, has it ever stopped war? I, I would imagine the, I suppose the simple answer is probably and regrettably no, unless you, you know otherwise. And I really did try to research this to find one particular example of, of it stopping war altogether. So photographs in, in and of themselves perhaps don't stop wars, it would seem. But... There's more nuance to this. As always, there's, there's always nuance. And the story gets interesting and, and, well, positively influencing to a degree. You'll be familiar, I'm, I'm sure, with Nick Oot's photo titled Napalm Girl, which we've talked about on this show before. Many guests have, uh, have referenced. And it became this emblematic photograph uh, pulling on the consciences of, uh, of those who'd otherwise, well, not turned a blind eye to the war in Vietnam, but... But they hadn't really, I suppose from your armchair, they hadn't taken on the full consequences or, or, or perhaps didn't understand the, the complete man-made catastrophe that this had become until that picture. And that picture appeared around the world in newspapers, magazines, weeklies, periodicals. It appeared on television broadcasts. And there was an escalation of uh, anti-war protests worldwide. And it's thought... And this is what I read from my research, that the, the war ending six months later was uh, perhaps affected by this potent image. So there's food for thought. Um, here's, a, here's a story I know more personally in terms of the question, has photography brought about justice? Um, and I know this story through my friendship with my, well, my close friend, Giles Penfound, the former British Army photographer whose who's brutal and stark and disturbing images made following the Amici massacre in 1993 led directly um, as evidence to the conviction of two war criminals tried in The Hague and now who are serving time. Perhaps a chilling nod, of course, to the work the photographers are now doing in Ukraine. So I think the answer to that one is yes. I've seen Giles' archive on this and I wonder, really, I wonder how he made them, but it was very important that he did. Has photography done anything positive for the victims of these terrible crimes on humanity? Well, I wrote to today's guest, actually, about this, uh, Jason Florio, and, and um, he sent me back a response because Jason has been in, in many places that uh, you and I probably wouldn't want to see firsthand, though we, uh, we witnessed them um, on, on the news. And he wrote back with a, well, as he says, a, a personal example of why he feels the work of documentary photojournalists is not in vain. He says, in the, the early days of working on our Gambia Victims and Resisters project, I photographed and interviewed a government official who had suffered deeply under the former regime, jailed on false pretexts, personally targeted by the president. And when released, he basically became a ghost of the civil dead. He couldn't find employment. He was blacklisted, plunged his family into poverty. And after spending the afternoon with him, he said to me, look, I, I, don't, I don't care what you do with my pictures or interview, but the fact that you took the time to listen to me is enough. And I think that's a, a very 
potent example from Jason. And then finally, does photography bring about change in the corridors of power? Well, for this final one, I want to, to lean on the, the super important work of the late photojournalist, dear Tom Stoddart, who had this to say on the subject when we spoke about the, the difference pictures make. And he thinks clearly that uh, they do make a difference. And he cites a, a very good example. Um, so Tom first, that's the first voice you're going to hear. Then a short clip from a, a TED talk, which I will link to on the show page, made by James Nackway, about why photographers make these pictures uh, they do and why they believe, like Tom, uh, that they, they do have a positive impact. Still pictures are incredibly powerful, still incredibly powerful things. If you think of the pictures from Abu Ghraib, torture, uh, prison, you know, what other stills would, uh, what other kind of medium would get Don Donald Rumsfeld to go on television and admit that the United States were doing this and apologize for it? If the stills didn't exist, um, you know, there's no way he would have done that, but they do exist. Photographers go to the extreme edges of human experience to show people what's going on. Sometimes they put their lives on the line because they believe your opinions and your influence matter. They aim their pictures at your best instincts generosity, the sense of right and wrong, the ability and the willingness to identify with others, the refusal to accept the unacceptable. James Nakwe, and prior to that, Tom Stoddart. And my thanks, Chris. Chris Leyland for sending in the question. Uh, two weeks in a row, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to issue you with uh, one of our flasks. So I will. I'm sending you one, which reminds me to ask for your address. Uh, note to self, ask for Chris's address. Note made. Uh, right, a complete change of tone now. Thank you for and to those who've been following and joining in with the assignment shows on Monday that started last month. Was it last month or the month before? <laughs> These months, Barney, they go past so quickly, don't they? Yes, I'm looking at you. I'm not so worried. Can we just walk on? OK, all right. And we've, we've had a, a super response to it, and I'm thrilled that you're liking the idea of these, uh, these new shorter-length series of shows that uh, are on the Monday. Um, it shouldn't feel like a stressful challenge, though. <laughs> uh, and I know that sometimes you won't necessarily have a chance to take on board a photo challenge there and then for the next seven days. So uh, the idea is that you can, you can dip in and out. And the reason I say this now is a few people have said, uh, I'm sorry, have I, got, have I got it in in time? As if it's the, the homework. And um, so, no, don't panic, don't worry. The idea is that once you've heard the assignment, whenever that is, then over the next seven days, um, you, you make your picture for said assignment. We have had some historic ones, that's okay. Um, but uh, yes, really, it's, uh, the idea is to go out and make something over the next seven days after hearing the assignment. So I would imagine in the months to come, I'll still be uploading pictures to uh, the relevant show pages from assignments that were, whoa, weeks and months before the current one if that makes sense. So you can join in with whatever challenge you want, whenever you want. There is no cutoff. But uh, one, of the, um, one of the letters with a picture reacting to episode 297, which is where, where stand by, where Mally Davis challenged you to go and make a picture of a tree with a story, or a tree that strikes you emotionally and photographically, was from Kevin Beecham, who sent in some trees that didn't seem to belong to where he was walking his dog. It was a black and white picture. Uh, a portrait orientated one, wasn't it, Kevin? Yes, it was. Um, but it was the pictures from his wife, Rachel, that he sent in, made from the, the passenger seat of the car as they travelled, that uh, had the, the wire brushes running across my memory spark plugs in that sort of, oh, yes, I wonder how many other people do that kind of way. And Kevin... Uh, wrote alongside, I'm not really a tree or nature person, but our family does have a favourite set of trees, and they're known as Nearly Home. And they always greet us when we get back to Cornwall, a place that we love and hope to move back to one day. And I hope that you too enjoy them. And, and here they are, Rach Rachel's pictures of your trees, known as Nearly Home. So when they pass them, I guess they all shout together, Nearly Home, which I think is a lovely story. Uh, and Kevin and Rachel, I, 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 the reason why it got me thinking was because I have exactly the same sort of thing with one solitary tree that sits 
out of the right-hand uh, window of, of car as I, as I travel home to Berkshire from the West Country on the M4 motorway, a journey I do often, actually, because of the kind of jobs I have. I'm often going out to, to the west of the country. And now, I call my one, as I pass by, I call it Hazel's Tree. Hazel's Tree, Neil? Why Hazel's Tree? Well, I'll tell you. It's, um, it's close to the memory service station. It sits high up on a hill. It's a magnificent tree. And for me, it just reminds me of the tree from Watership Down. Um, that beautiful, and we've talked about this film before, old school style animated film. It's wonderful where Hazel the rabbit, the animated rabbit, breathes his last after a long life finding his tree. See, he had to find a tree and, uh, and a new warren for all the rabbits that followed him, escaping the evil warren from where they were before. Um, and I saw that film, and this is why I, I was slightly gooey-eyed whenever I see the, the tree and think about it, really, because I saw the film sat between my dear mum and dad, my late mum and dad, and it came out two days after my 11th birthday, and we, we saw it in the old Hartford cinema. Oh, I know that one, Neil. Hartford Cinema, was it along the Ware Road? Yes, that's the one. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you now, it's a block of flats. Oh, Neil, really? A block of flats? Yes, it's a block of flats. No longer a cinema. Um, but uh, it, was the, it was the film, the film, where I, I think I first found teared up emotion in the darkness of a, of a movie house. As uh, well, it's the closing scene, really, as Hazel's spirit rabbit is it spirit rabbit? I suppose spirit rabbit self. Hazel, anyway, Hazel lies down, and this uh, this sort of god of of all rabbits invites him to come and bound through the uh, the trees of heaven forever. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> after the journey of this movie, that particular closing scene, it just got to me. Are you all right, darling? My mum probably would have said, yes, I'm fine, mum. I'm sure it's a bit of dust in here, that's all. And, uh, yeah, it's a, just a glorious film. And I tell you what, I'll share the scene with you. It must be on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> I've set myself a challenge now. I'll share the film or that, that particular scene with you on, uh, on the, the show page. Um, I'm hoping that YouTube have it. I'm sure they will. It's a, <laughs> it's a terrible spoiler for the film if you want to watch the whole thing, isn't it? But, yes, I was like a wreck. I was like, come on, Jamesy boy, pull yourself together. You're crying at, at an animation film. Must be your hormones. Uh, but, uh, yes, that film, and I, I have watched it. I watched it. When did I last watch it? Maybe, a, I don't know, a couple of, couple of years ago. Late, late night viewing, I'm sure. It's a real watch on your own when the kids have gone to bed movie. Well, it is for me anyway. Richard Adams, who wrote the book, actually had the, um, he had the, the manuscript, yes, he had that turned down several times. It's a real story of endeavour. He wrote it for his, uh, his two girls, uh, that particular story. And he had it turned down, but he never gave up. And thank goodness he didn't give up. It's such a oh, fantastic story. It really is. It warms the cockles of your heart, it does. Cockles of your heart, Neil. Blimey, you Brits are truly odd. Well, here's, here's a link, and yes, I, I did note this one down, from... From cockles to oysters. Oh, told you I was weaving a story. Let's move the story now. 2,764 miles, give or take, uh, from my office to the Gambia, to a place that Gambians call traffic lights. So it may not be a tree, or they may not be trees, but uh, the locals in this particular part of Fajara reference this modern-day landmark where once I, I, I dare say huge trees may well have stood, uh, but they reference it as the directional point from which everything can be found the street doesn't have a name so you might say where is the local supermarket easy turn right at traffic lights and if you want to find my first guest the international photojournalist jason florio and you're coming from the airport at banjul um, after say about 30 minutes turn left at traffic lights and keep driving until you can't drive any further and you'll find jason right next to crocodile beach and I, I thought today we'd hear from a photographer who goes in in search of stories and sells them to magazines. And I, I know he's going to reference himself as a bad salesperson because I've edited our chat. And frankly, isn't that where many photographers um, feel they are when they, they go to try and sell themselves or their work? But I wanted to record a few moments with him talking about his story, um, this particular story that he made. And I want to do a few more 
assignment stories with photographers where we can just talk about one thing that they have photographed. And so today we talk about um, the incredible oyster ladies of the Gambia who he photographed for a Guardian story. Jason, you've been working on a, a new project. Well, it's not so new, actually. You started a couple of years ago now Now that you tell me uh, off air. But uh, it's about farming, essentially. But not the farming you naturally connect to the word. Not, not, well, not for me in West Africa. I didn't instantly think oyster farming when I thought of West Africa. And that's, that's, there's no reason why not, because Atlantic oysters, they say, are the best in the world anyway. <laughs> so that's the story you've been working on. Tell me about it. So going back probably hundreds and hundreds of years along this coastline people have um collected uh, oysters from the from the tentacles of the of the mangroves yeah. which flank river gambia here and so the tributaries which are a brackish are a great site for for the oysters to grow and again for you know, for hundreds of years people have come and hacked them off and They've used them for the meat, but they've also used the the shells, which are broken down and used for uh, for kind of local paints on houses. They're also used for chicken food. Mm. It's quite a, they sort of use every every part of the the oysters. But they, they've been damaging the the mangroves as well, haven't they? Now that I, I didn't realise this about the way that oysters were were farmed. Yeah, so they the way it's done now is that they're they're a lot more uh, conscientious about the environment yeah. so you know before people would come and the easiest thing would do would just sort of hack the branches off of the mangroves which are these sort of uh tentacles that go in into the river and as it's tidal there's a, obviously certain times of the day when you can actually uh collect them out they collect the oysters yeah, you know, the ladies I think just who are tra- traditionally the ones that do the uh, the oyster farming would just sort of hack the branches off, throw them in their canoes, and then yeah, you know, wait till they got back to actually chip them off of the off these tentacles. Yeah. But you know, thanks to a thing called the Tri Oyster Collective, they've been working with the with the UN, um, I think with UNOPS to actually sort of train the ladies to be not only you know, more conscientious farmers, but also be kind of guardians of the mangroves as well. You know, they've been taught the importance of the mangroves in the you know, in in the ecosystem and and preserving that ecosystem. And as you say, the farmers are, are mainly female, aren't they? Yeah, one hundred percent female, I should think. And the, the whole process is very female driven from from the collection to the preparation and to the selling as well so it's it's a very it's a it's, it's female power at its best so how how as a photographer did you get involved in in this story i mean i i saw the piece in the guardian yeah yeah my, you know i've been coming to gambia on and off for about 20 something years and one of the very first photographs i ever made was of a uh, it was when i had my eight by i was working with an eight by ten deardorf camera and not in the grove surely well on the bank at least anyway (laughs) um and i made a portrait of these oyster ladies that i used to buy oysters from as i was at that time i spent like two weeks living on the riverbank but i never actually thought about going out and and you know following them on the river at that point i was doing these very clunky portraits with this old camera and about two years ago i got an assignment uh, it's actually for brussels airlines magazine to do a story on a group of the oyster ladies Mm. And I was sort of kicking myself why I hadn't actually been out with them 18 plus years ago. But I spent a couple of days with them. Uh, I rented a small boat so I could follow them as they kind of go on their journey out through the mangroves. And it was, it was yeah, I was really pleased with the, with the pictures. I loved working with these ladies. They're just a really dynamic group. And that was it. That sort of parked that story. And then uh, a few weeks ago, a friend of mine, a writer called J.R. Patterson, he wrote a piece on another group of oyster ladies, which was pitched to The Guardian. The Guardian came to me for pictures. So I presented some of the work I'd already done. And they said, actually, we'd like some additional pictures of this new group. So Helen and I went down to Lamin, which which is an area um, which is sort of like a bit of a tourist area, but the the, um, the ladies use it as their launch site. So we got down there about seven o'clock in the morning, and then we sort of went off into the to the sort of uh, semi sunrise out onto the mangroves. And it was just I, it's just idyllic out there. It's just yeah, so peaceful. Yeah. 
sound of the birds and it's just the sound of the paddles and then just the chipping of the the oysters off the mangroves and the ladies are singing and calling to each other it, it's it's you know, probably hasn't changed in hundreds of years the way they're doing it tell me though you recorded the sound from that surely oh i'm gonna have to go again i, I felt like i want to go and make a little film now about it yeah. because I, I did a couple of little bits with the iphone as we were paddling out but it was you know i, I was focused on making a still story on it and i think it would take a another visit to really get some mm. good video and audio maybe you'll come and do the audio and i'd love to i'm, 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 I'm there. there i'm there they have a limited time to make their money don't they the season's quite short yeah they've it's down to about four months yeah. and what what happens is it's not only just that the four months which is quite a tight time period it's also the duration in the day when they can collect because They've got to gauge it to be able to you know, get out to the the growing areas, and then they're fight. They're, they're working as quickly as possible against the rising tide, yeah. because as soon as it gets up to kind of where the leaves are touching the the water, then the man the uh, the oysters are all completely submerged at that point. So. Is it is it dangerous work at all? Well, they've actually started getting a lot of the ladies to wear life jackets because mm. it turns out, despite all of them have probably been on the river since they were they were young women um a lot of them can't swim oh. so there's been part of the initiative is to make sure at least they have life jackets kind of on the canoe they don't often wear them because they find it they're too bulky to yeah they've got to sort of climb within the mangroves and some of them are working from their canoes to chip them off yeah. and then some of them are actually getting out and in sort of wading into the water where it's it's shallow enough but the the most dangerous part is actually these uh, the shells of the of the oysters and not like those very sort of i'd say you know maybe the ones from normandy or something mm. Yeah, you know, these ones are very kind of brutal they're super sharp razor sharp edges on them so they have to be very very careful the way they kind of hold them and then chip chip them off the uh off the tentacles so a lot of people do get you know kind of cut up in some you know nasty accidents oh, for sure well, were you or helen did you jump into the water as well with uh, now you haven't got the plate camera uh, I, I yeah, it's float, the floating did off. Um, I the first time we went out, I was able to get into the water with them. But the, this new area we went to, it was it was too deep on the edges, so we had to do everything from the, another canoe. Uh, Two thousand alasses per day, thirty quid. Um, I, I, that was yeah. in the article, so I, that that's that's what um, they earn. In terms of wages in the country in the Gambia, how how does how does that compare? That's pretty good, actually. You know, it wasn't too long ago that people were working on farms as day laborers for about fifty dollars a day, which was about seventy-five p. So they they do they do quite well. Um, but obviously, the time, like we talked about earlier, that you know their window of actually making that money is is pretty short. Yeah, yeah. And what they're saying is as well, there are more women who are coming out to to collect the oysters so yeah there's there's more competition out there for sure the the oyster ladies and and actually working the water and collecting farming the the oysters is one part of the story and i noticed there were there are, are, are other photographs you made and i wonder as a photojournalist you're you're saying well yeah we got this story but let me do something more for you and take this on water to market to plate which is what you've effectively done is was that your idea to extend the story and uh, and, and say to them, well, you've only got half the story. You need you need the yeah. whole story. I think the, the f- when I when I first photographed them a couple of years ago, I really wanted to to show the full process. Yeah. Um, so we went we went out on the river, then we came back to do the the uh, the steaming and the the smoking of smoking, them, yeah. um, and then you know the the final part. So it was I felt like I wanted to give them a you know a soup to nuts kind of yeah. piece on it. The, when I did the first trip with them, they they cooked up a, a batch and they did this fantastic oyster stew kind of right there on the yeah. on the piles of shells, which was which was absolutely knockout. You know, they got this local bread called tapalapa, which I think you probably remember. It's a very dense kind of baguette, yes. And that with a lashings of oyster and onions in there is just as oh. it doesn't get much better to have a riverside oh. snack hang on get me a flight quick i'm out <laughs> <laughs> as as a photojournalist um, you're you're based in west africa now and um, these sort of stories, obviously, um, it makes sense to have somebody on the ground go and photograph them because no longer do people fly out from the metropoles, from New York and 
from from mm. from Paris. Uh, yeah. or I remember those good old days of yeah. being in New yeah. York and <laughs> getting the call and jumping on a plane. That think, was, that think, was things have changed slightly. How does it work for you? Because you're based in West Africa. Does that does that mean you have to look for your photo stories? Are you selling the ideas to magazines now? Have you have you become the salesperson? Um, I'm a rubbish salesperson. I will tell you that. Um, <laughs> I will be honest. It's it's a good. It's maybe a combination. Yeah, I'm lucky enough where I've. You know, I'm, I am getting assignment work and a lot of it is because I'm here. And that was one of the reasons we left New York about seven years ago to see if we if we establish ourselves here just by being here with the work come. And, and thankfully, it has you know, has been that way. You know, that being said, I'm still you know kind of pitching here and there as uh, you know, as I think decent stories come up. I, I find actually it's good to get a bit of perspective. I find sometimes when you're when I'm here, I kind of lose sight of how interesting it is sometimes. Yeah. So I love it. Maybe when someone comes to me and says, oh, we want to do this story on the Oyster Ladies, which I it was on my doorstep, but I hadn't really didn't realize the significance of it and didn't think anyone would be interested in it. So it, yeah. it's always nice when someone gives you a fresh point of view of your where we're based. And then I can use all my experience and expertise of being here to you know, to dive into the story. I spoke recently to Kieran Dodds, a Scottish photojournalist who travels far wide and close to home to make his stories. And often he, he creates a story that magazines may buy from ideas that he has as photo projects for himself personally. And I think that's that's relevant for those listening who feel they may have a story like like the oyster women farmers of the Gambia, in that uh, what well, well, that sort of see a need fill a need way is 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 that how you work it, that you find a a project that you're passionate about that you feel just may have value to a magazine as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I have been, and I'm just starting on a on a new personal project here i don't know if it's going to go anywhere it's at the early early stages you know i feel like i've been photographed i've been, you know did a long-term project with the victims of the former regime which yeah, i think we'd, yeah. we'd even touched upon before yeah. and that was a sort of a personal project that turned into something a lot bigger and you ended up getting kind of grants and funding for to continue it so i'm looking to get into something else and i think having been in on and off in the gambia for so long I think the longer I'm here, the more foreign I feel. And so I thought I, I was interested to meet people who've been here for a long time. And so I've started a little portrait series on people, on expats who've kind of, not saying they've gone bush, but they've <laughs> sort of slightly disconnected themselves from the outside world. And I'm just intrigued to see why they would want to give up, you know, kind of all the comforts of, of living in Europe to live a kind of a much more simplified life here in West Africa. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Because uh, I think of expats that move to places like Spain, particularly the Brits that move to Spain, mm. as actually putting themselves into... Um, I, well, I know this because I, I lived I lived amongst them um, in Lanzarote when I lived there for a year, decades ago, that they put them, they lifted themselves up and put themselves into a... Um, a, a new smaller England in in a yeah. part of the old town. That's the way it usually works. But you're saying it doesn't work that way in West Africa. Well, I think it it you know there's definitely an expat bubble here for sure, and I'm definitely part of that. That's why I love just sort of getting out and you know getting back out into the into the provinces, yeah. which I've been very lucky to do over the last few weeks. So I kind of get back to let's say sort of when I say real Gambia, it's it's a side of Gambia I really enjoy. It yeah. feels authentic in a certain respect without um but there are a number of people i've met here who've kind of well let me let me put it this way <laughs> i was at the supermarket one day and an american guy came up to me and he said hey bud you know what are you what are you doing in gambia he's, and uh, he said are you are you working here or are you just a shipwreck <laughs> <laughs> so i've kind of been intrigued about this idea of sort of shipwrecks here I think, well that could be a I, I, I think that's a perfect um title for the uh, for the yeah. for the project i don't think of where you live by the way and and without this sounding like it's two mates just having a chat but but <laughs> i i don't think of where you live as being particularly expat i mean there aren't many places where you wander just 50 yards down the road to have a drink and there's a there's a you're, you're within touching distance of a sign that says watch out for the crocodiles, the crocodiles yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and i don't see many yeah. tourist beaches with those kinds of signs no and the, yeah the, the crocs are they're there they're big big buggers as well um <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I guess it's, like I said, it's strange. You know, we would, yeah, sometimes you don't see it. I, that's why I've just, you know, I was just back in the UK for a few months and it was great to be away and come back again with sort of fresh eyes and, you know, see, see the, the uniqueness and the, and the beauty of this place. For, you know, for what it is mm. and the, you know, just the color, the noise, the smells, it's, it's, it's really, really special and very, very invigorating. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you a loaded question for the reason that we've been looking at the possibility of a photo retreat in the Gambia. Mm. Um, five or six photographers, where would you be? Where would you be sending them? For me, like I said, I've just been up in the provinces and I really love working in areas where saying the daily life is it hasn't sort of changed a whole lot not saying that the you know people have not got mobile phones and they've got much better access to you know to information and and healthcare and that sort of thing but i kind of like the idea of of this sort of slowing down the pace a little bit but once you, I think the thing is, is you've just got to embed here a little bit. You see, you find a couple of people to hang out with, and you know, even if it's like say on on the on the beach with the fishermen, you yeah. know, you find a couple of the which fishermen done, that you yeah. can, yeah. which yeah, you can spend yeah. a bit of time with and just to get absorbed into their world. And soon they'll yeah, they're very friendly people, and yeah. you know, I think people will will allow you into their world. It's it's not a place just to sort of walk around for snappy snappy street photography no. in like a New York kind of sense. I think it's more considered storytelling. I I thought yes, I, I I believe that because if you don't want to just sort of just make the obvious pictures all the time, it's very easy to to mm. grab the color and mm. the sort of uh, kinetic energy of 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 you know some of the ur- urban areas. Mm. Um, but I think it's a place to you know to get to know people and you know maybe before you even pick the camera up, you're you're sit, sat hanging out having a tea with someone and. Let the story. I think so. I think it was Steve McCurry was sort of saying about you know, just sit on the corner for a while and you know, kind of allow this allow things to come to you. And I think that's a lovely thing to do in Gambia. Just sit. Someone's going to come and talk to you. They want to know what you're up to. They do. Yeah. Well, I remember. I remember four day the the driver that uh, um, was with me uh, and looking after me and making sure I didn't do too many daft things. Probably yeah. sat me sat me down when he went off to get a coffee or something. <laughs> he sat me down <laughs> ne- next to next to a barber's. Um, all on my own. He said, wait, yeah. <laughs> wait. He said, well, like a little command. And that mm. was fascinating because you're right. People come over and they want to know what you're doing. Before you know it, yeah. you've become the barber's photographer. Yeah, exactly. And, and they're, you know, and photographically, uh, I mean, the place is, it's sort of chaotic and it's wonderful. I mean, I love the, the slightly brokenness of it. It's its definitely no kind of clean lines here. Everything's sort of a bit higgledy-piggledy and... Mm. It takes you a while to sort of uh, maybe decipher what it is that you're actually seeing. And I think that's the, the beauty. I love you know, making pictures here and then sort of come back and suddenly go, oh, I didn't notice that in the picture. And there's all these other sort of elements in there. It's, it's very, very rich. Jason Florio. I feel like the, uh, the cat is out of the bag to an extent. So uh, here's the plan-ish. Yes, we are looking at the possibility of our, our first African adventure a continental retreat in the Gambia uh, in January or February next year. Um, I'll keep you posted, but if it's the sort of thing you might be interested in, and it's entirely different to the adventures that we've had in the Isle of Wight, which was fantastic, and the adventure coming in, uh, in Inverness in Scotland, which is going to be fantastic. This will be different, obviously also in terms of budget, but if it's the sort of thing you might be interested in, I'd like to gauge your interest. So uh, send, me, uh, send me your thoughts to studio at photographydaily.show. This is wonderful. We've, we've, um, look at this, Barnes. We've walked into an area where there's, well, there's, uh, it's not exactly a carpet of bluebells, but they're dotted around and there's one, two, three, four, four dead trees that are, are still majestically rising. Um, they look fantastic in, well, it just feels like a meadow. There's no stream, but let me get a shot for you so that you can see on the show page today where I've been walking with my camera. So, X100V today, as I said, F4, 280th shutter speed. It's a bit of a lifeless sky, actually. That's a shame we had such a... We had a wonderful blue sky earlier with, uh, with high white... Is it Cirrus? Let's get that. 160 ISO. I'm going to call that my meadow. Should we call that our meadow, Barney? Yeah, let's do that. A quick thank you 
for those that uh, are sending their mails in at the moment on a wide range, a wide breadth of subjects. Thank you so much. You are so generous with your thoughts. And uh, I've got many mails, and you know, you probably get the sense um, when, when you hear some stories that are read out that have literally just been read uh, or written in, and some that, uh, come on, Barney, this way. Come on. What's he found? What have you found? Stop eating everything. We've got lunch to come. Um, yeah, so I, I know sometimes the stories seem entirely out of order. Uh, occasionally you'll find somebody who's, who's written in uh, only a week ago and then I do a letter that's been written in a couple of months ago. But I, I try to find some sort of uh, order and sense, some semblance of sense and order when I'm, I'm reading them out. And if you have written in, do not fear, it will be featured. Send them to studio at photographydaily.show, studio at photographydaily.show. And, and um, if you're sending a picture, because I'm thrilled to receive your pictures, uh, please can you remember 2,000 pixels wide, um, don't uh, watermark them because we'll, uh, we'll pop them on the show page and, of course, make links to your websites and your Instagram or whatever you so wish. Uh, 2,000 pixels wide, and uh, that will do the job. Like many independent podcasters around this wonderful planet of ours, we have a Patreon page where some special friends help support this show uh, for the price of a cup of high street coffee or a roll of HP5 black and white film, which is my favourite film stock, as you know by now. Um, I have actually, on um, coming up on the the Moore Show, the Saturday Show, I'm going to um, I'm going to play you what happened when I went to Giles's to uh, to go develop my films. <laughs> I'm hoping that the experiments underground, in particular, worked out well. That's coming up very soon on the Moore Show. Our Patreon friends help support the time that it takes to make and sustain these shows. Um, it may be free to listen to, but it's. Uh, <laughs> It's not free to make. So for those who support it with a few pennies and pounds, cents and dollars and euros, or mountain goats per month, or delasses, perhaps, uh, in other currencies, a sincere and heartfelt glowing thank you for your faith in building this, not just as a, as a resource, but also, a, I think, a real channel of friendship. And to say thank you, I make an additional short diary-styled show each week, which you can only hear on the, the Patreon web page or the wonderful app which has just been updated make sure you update your app so you can do so much more with it now um, on your smartphones and the the show is called more it's a, a little oasis of extra audio and features and we meet once a month on zoom and of course um, the new replay interview uh, show has just gone live it comes out on wednesday stroke thursdays i think it's going to end up being thursdays but uh, the plan <laughs> the plan is wednesdays uh, it's a, a, a photographic resource where we re-edit and replay interviews from the last two years. Free of any additional chat, it's just straight into the interview. And, uh, and this week just gone, my word, a chance to hear the, the unplugged conversation with none other than Joel Meyerowitz. Uh, there are around about 100 plus extra shows and bits to listen to or read. So there's, uh, there's lots on there. Um, I love you also to meet our patrons, so this week let me play you a moment from a feature that we have on The Moore Show, uh, not every week, but most weeks, called Five Things I Love About Photography. And this week, or, or rather tomorrow, on Moore, you're going to meet Jens Roder. Okay, the first thing I like about photography is it gets me off the couch. I have a neuromuscular condition that leaves me with less strength than the average person. And sometimes it is very easy to feel sorry for oneself and just stay in the couch. When I have to get up and get out and do some photographs, I actually get out in the fresh air. And someone has told me it is very healthy. Jens Roder. And uh, yes, on, uh, on tomorrow's More Show, you'll hear the other four reasons to complete the story why Jens loves photography. Um, and do make sure, if you are a patron, do up, make sure you update your app because there are some improvements, such as you can save your place in, in particular shows. And, uh, and also you can uh, list in order all the unlistened two shows and a few other things besides. So do make sure you, uh, you update your app if indeed you listen to the, uh, the patron shows on the app and not the website couple of letters. Kerry, Kerry Adams, first of all. I listened to this week's podcast. Brilliant as always. You're so generous, Kerry. Thank you. I always listen to it at work with my headphones on. I have my phone in my pocket 
And at the end, I, I went to switch Spotify off and noticed my phone had done something in my pocket. No, not the dreadful, your phone has done something in your pocket that you weren't otherwise expecting or planning for. Yes, that one, Neil. I'd only managed somehow to share your podcast link of the show to Ronnie O'Sullivan's personal messaging on Instagram. Now, I haven't received a message back and I don't expect to either, as I must look like one of those folk that send random links, but I did have to laugh and thought it would be a great thing if Ronnie started to listen to the, the show because of this. Well, first of all, Ronnie, Ronnie O'Sullivan, if you don't know who he is, he is, a, he is a snooker player and a very, very good snooker player, one of the top stars. And, uh, and that, now that will make sense when uh, you listen to the last sentence from Kerry's letter. Talk about potting a podcast in your pocket. There we go. Very cleverly written. Also, Kerry says, can I ask what the music is that you play over the end of some of your conversations? The one at the end of your chat with Grant Scott, for example. Well, yes, you can. It's a, it's a piece of music we, uh, we use quite often, isn't it? And it's by an artist called Martin Puringer. And it's called Ocean of Lights. And as a song, it's described as love, hopeful, peaceful, serious, dramatic, sad. Well, they're the categories that it falls under in the uh, art list catalog and you know that i use artlist.io for for the music on this show fantastic resource for uh, filmmakers and uh, and photographers particularly if you're commercial actually because um it doesn't cost the earth to uh, to include music from artlist in your commercial projects and that's important you can use as many as you want once you've paid your one subscription sound like i'm doing an advert you are neil i'm not i'm <laughs> but i'm a personal user and i i believe in it as you as you well know and uh, 365s, thank you for the 365s that you continually send in on the, uh, for the, for the, uh, the website, photographydaily.show. It's the Community 365 Project, where um, we give you a chance to join in with a 365 without feeling you have to do a picture every day and the stress that comes with that. Uh, John Miller sent uh, in Wednesdays, Glorious picture, John, which you will describe admirably for us in your letter or the piece that you wrote, actually, to go with the 365 uh, image that's on the website. But also it plays beautifully into today's conversation about uh, uh, having a personal relationship with trees. I promise, by the way, in the, ne <laughs> in the coming weeks, we will not necessarily talk about trees all the time. But uh, he says, I refer to this... Uh, as my M1 tree, and I will link to this picture on the show page today, although we'll describe it for you. My submission is inspired by the episode of Photography Daily where you were talking to Andre Vakek and the situation in Ukraine and his photography of it. Uh, the colours in the picture sort of lean to where I'm going here. Anyway, the M1 tree is a tree that I see on a hilltop heading north on the M1 motorway, not far from a place called Hardwick Hall. I've been photographing it for some time, and when passing that way, I always pay it a visit. You see? A personal relationship with a tree. I passed it on Wednesday, and it was standing out particularly well with a glorious yellow rapeseed crop in the foreground, topped off with a lovely blue sky, just a few fluffy clouds to break up the negative space a little. So I took a picture of just the rapeseed and the sky without clouds as the colours were the same as the Ukrainian flag. And it felt like my own little photographic homage to Ukraine with um, that beautiful imposing tree in the, the picture as well. Honestly, it is quite the picture. It really is fabulous. It, it certainly is. And, and you're right, it is um, quite the homage as well. Um, what should we play for some inspiration? Well, American documentary photographer Haley Sadler, who's been uh, covering the, the refugee crisis in Ukraine. We haven't managed to talk to Haley during this time, but um, I'm certainly intending to catch up with her at some stage for this show. And I spoke with her last year about being a photojournalist and telling very personal stories. Uh, I'll link to her website and her work today, and I think you'll see immediately the, uh, the personal nature of her storytelling. And here she is talking about her work and the privilege of telling these stories. I definitely become very um, involved and invested in them, especially because I always try to spend as much time as possible with folks to really be able to, to learn their stories and not kind of just parachute in. As you, as you get to know people, you certainly can get, you know, just so invested in, in their stories and what they've been through and what they share with you. It's such a privilege for someone to share their story with you at all. 
And so as you sit there and you hear those, um, their words, what they've been through, their experiences, their memories, it's just such a privilege. And I think that weight does sit heavy on your shoulders and it should sit heavy on your shoulders because that is a big responsibility to, to carry that and to ensure that you're, you're doing justice to that. I think that sometimes it is like a long, a long-term relationship building process. It's not always like you sit down and you say, tell me your deepest feelings and in your life story. You know, sometimes it is a long relationship building process before it gets to that point. So certain people, it, it takes longer and it takes time to build that trust. And then certain people, I think you sit down with them and they are just very ready to share and they, they want to share that. So I think for everyone is different and every experience as you sit down with someone is a bit different mm -hmm. as well. But anytime someone does choose, you know, to open up to you and to share that with you, then I think there's always that kind of emotion as you as you sit there and you hear it and you think, wow, I'm so privileged to be the one, you know, sitting here in this room or sitting in this tent and hearing this, this story. Words and thoughts from Haley Sadler. And of course, I will put a link to the episode where I talked to Haley on the, uh, on the show page today. Do make sure you go and look at the show page for episode 300, the 300th episode today, because, of course, we have links to, um, to those that uh, I speak to on the program and those that send photographs in. If you want to, then I'd be delighted to receive them. Send to studio at photographydaily.show with your pictures being 2,000 pixels wide, please. Um, we've changed that a bit. It used to be 2,000 pixels on the long side, whatever long side that was, but it's now wide. 2,000 pixels wide, please. So, yes, the show page will be full of links, things for you to follow. And if, uh, <laughs> if I've managed, uh, the, the, um, the film link or the last, uh, the last uh, scene or so from, uh, from Watership Down I might end up having to share the whole film. I don't know. We'll see when we, when we get back to base and go looking for that. Neil, don't set yourself challenges that you might not be able to deliver. Oh, look at this. This spread of bluebells. Beautiful. I'll get a picture of that in a moment and put that on the show page for you. Here is a mail from Joel Riley in Memphis. Memphis land. I love Memphis. Who is remembering last week's mention of the Bathrooms of the World project that I have on Instagram. Just to explain that, we were talking about um, Instagram profiles that you have as, um, as a hobby. Well, in my case, actually... The, it's, an inst, it's an Instagram uh, project which uh, is of photographs of the smallest room. That's what I call it uh, on my travels. It's, I know it's weird. I know it's odd. I know it's strange. Uh, but it's got nothing to do with my businesses um, and everything to do with just this, this sort of humorous, well, it's a sort of humorous, almost coffee table style um, Instagram profile about bathrooms of the world. I think that's explained it. But uh, Joel Riley, yes, he says, I was reminded when hearing you describe the, the small privy you encountered during your bus tour in Haiti of a series of photographs I took during a backpacking trip in Yellowstone National Park in 2014. I took along a tough little Nikon Coolpix digital camera to document the trip, and one of the, uh, the day hikes was to the summit of Mount Sheridan. Now, I'm a bit confused here because you did tell me that the summit is 10,000 feet. And I always thought that that meant that you had to 10,000 feet. Isn't that where you have to have oxygen? Well, you may have done. I don't know. Um, but uh, write back to me and, and tell me that because I'm a, I'm a bit confused about that. But uh, it's one of the most impressive peaks, Mount Sheridan, he says, in the park with views of the Yellowstone uh, Lake to the north. Though the views are breathtaking, my attention was briefly drawn to a small privy, a loo, a WC, or whatever it's called in your language, at uh, the summit. Well, you know, when you've got to go, <laughs> you've got to go. You've just climbed 10,000 feet. You want to find somewhere comfortable at the end of that run, don't you? Um, and I, I snapped a few pictures of this anomalous little room. The messages on the outside and the inside of the door were as charming as the room itself. Open season, it said, June 15th to October 31st. And for full effect, latch door open. Oh, I see. So when you're using the privy, the loo, the WC, the bathroom, 
um, you can actually open the door and look out to these views. Uh, of course, I obliged and took a picture from the perch with the door latched open. I thought you might enjoy this little collage of the smallest room in Yellowstone. Um, I do. I very much appreciate it. And if you don't mind, can I use it on my, on my silly Instagram thing, you know, that, <laughs> that we were talking about last week? Um, I'm looking at you and you seem to be nodding. Are you nodding? Or is that a look of confusion? The other two photographs attached are a view of Sheridan in the background with a hot spring in the foreground during our approach hike and a view to the north from the summit. Sincerely, Joel Riley in Memphis in Tennessee. Uh, fantastic. Thank you for that. And it did make me chuckle. That privy being at the top of uh, a 10,000 foot privy where you open the door uh, and take pictures while you're... Well, shall we move on? Uh, now imagine taking a sleeping bag, climbing a hill or a mountain, maybe 10,000 feet, uh, or just camping out waiting for the, the sun to rise, or as sometimes happens with my guest's experience, who you're just about to, to meet, to find yourself immersed perhaps in, uh, in a, a passing mountain fog or low mist, which lifts to reveal the most incredible scenes. You see, it's very romantic, I think. This is the life of a bivvy bagger. Now, if you're thinking, Neil, what is a bivvy? Or asking, Neil, what is a bivvy? Well, a bivvy, um, well, when I looked it up, the literal meaning is a small tent or a shelter. And in this case, though, the shelter is the, is the bag, it's the sleeping bag. These are not just any old sleeping bags, though. These are uh, uh, rather specialist ones, and you can spend an absolute fortune on them. Um, I saw, saw some of the prices. Mind you, if this is the only thing that gives you any comfort, then uh, probably the one thing you do invest in there, uh, being the bivvy bag, is, is quite important. So you sleep in this bivvy bag, you're there under the stars. It is the only thing that shields you from everything that nature can bring you, which includes sudden downpours. Some of these bivvies are you know, so well made that they can take all sorts of weather. Apparently, you, um, by being in a bivvy bag, you increase your body temperature by, or the temperature that you sleep within by four to eight degrees. Does that sound a lot? Probably not when there's a lot of snow outside. But uh, anyway, Stefan Henning introduced me to the softly spoken, wonderful hilltop adventurer who is Ronald Turnbull. And I just must remind you what, uh, what Stefan wrote when he sent us some pictures from a bike trip that he made on the 25th of March, so not so long ago. Stefan wrote, I packed my trusty steel horse, which I remember as a, uh, as a description I, I quite liked for a bike, Loaded up my camera gear, sleeping bag, warm clothes, tea and your Redheads or Gingers podcast and headed up to the Brocken, which is the highest peak here in northern Germany, 1,142 metres. I plan to sleep in a forest shelter overnight and ride up to the peak at sunrise. Ever since reading The Book of the Bivvy by Ronald Turnbull, I think I believe that all British people do such things in their leisure time. What, you mean just grab a sleeping bag and hike to the top of nearest hill and sleep there for the night? Uh, maybe some do. Uh, Turnbull, he says, mentions an obligatory stopover in a pub for dinner, which is what we did as well. The real climbing uphill started after that. I didn't expect much snow where we were, but fortunately I packed enough clothes and some rather wide tyres on the bike. I found my shelter... Slept until 4.30 a.m. and then set off to the peak. The reward, he says, was awesome. I'll let you have awesome on this occasion. I bought my X-T3 camera, got some nice photos. Can't do much wrong with a sunrise. Cup of tea later. <laughs> Slippery, icy downhill to the next train station to get me home before the family woke up. Blimey, you packed a lot in there. And it all starts with a bivvy adventure. Staying in your bivvy. So pardon me for the repeat of Stefan's letter, and I'll pop that picture on the show page again, but uh, it inspired me to, to approach Ronald, who seemed <laughs> somewhat surprised by my contact, to be honest, almost like I'd got the wrong person. And I have to say, I think, I think you'll hear that as I... Well, it's not so much a, as a theme, but you'll hear that as a tone of the conversation, I think. But I, I too, like Stefan, I, I ordered the book of the bivvy because this idea of a pub supper and then up into the hills with my camera to sleep in a, uh, in a bivvy 
uh, to catch a sunrise, I think I'm rather drawn to this idea. I probably do need a bivvy mate or two. So if you feel like you'd like to come along, I'm not so sure I could be on my own at the top of said mountain. Um, and I'm not so sure I'd take Sabark a lot because I think it'd be useless. It'd be up all night smelling the ground, sniffing and snorting and barking and stuff. Anyway, if the sunrise striking your cheeks of a morning with a light breeze to welcome you to another amazing day and the sound of a swallow dancing on that breeze is your thing, then um, I think you're going to enjoy the, the gentle giant now of bivy bagging. This is Ronald Turnbull. In 1995, Ronald, you started uh, to publish your first books on the great outdoors, all-weather walking, bivvying, and, and it's the, well, the best part of three decades later now. Is, is your approach to, to, to walking, walking long, walking lights, walking with a bivvy, has it, has it changed much? Um, well, I've got a bit more older, and as a result, I've got a bit softer. As far as bivvying goes, the main difference is that I now use a bivvy bag with feathers in it instead of the cheapest and lightest possible synthetic bivy bag because when I started I was a fell runner I would be running or you know walking and jogging across the hills for several days at a time yeah. and the bivy bag would always end up wet and I wanted it to be as light as possible. What is it about bivying? What is it about uh, walking with with a wind in your hair and the simple act of one foot in front of the other that's that's captivated you? Yeah well I've been at it since about 1850 if you can't back <laughs> through my family. It's just it's just very nice to be on top of a mountain, especially if you're fairly fit, yeah. clambering over the rocks and having the rain falling in your hair and seeing the great views or just looking at the inside of the cloud like I was on Monday. Oh, wow. You know, it's like saying, you know, what is it you enjoy about sex? You say, well, it's fun. I enjoy it. Although maybe not, not in a bivvy bag. <laughs> what, what, is this about, um, what is this about the pub supper that you, you have before you set out? For uh, a night on the uh, night on the hills or in the in the mountains, it's become this sort of um, trademark of yours, hasn't it? Um, well, it's part of sort of comfort and luxury. Yeah. I've never gone in for cooking when I'm on the hill because I use a bivy bag because it's lighter. And if you try and cook something in a bivy bag, mm. you end up colder than you were before you started. So I've always taken basic cold food up on the hill, like pork pies and apple pies and Mars bars and that kind of thing, muesli bars and had a nice hot meal in a pub whenever I come down to one. I, th I think we should probably describe exactly what bivying is. I mean, I, uh, perhaps this should have been my very first question. Bivying goes back a long, long way, doesn't it? Um, the kind of lightweight bivying is fairly recent because of the materials. I mean, it basically dates from the invention of Gore-Tex, but the idea of taking minimal equipment to the top of a hill and spending the night there, uh, well, it goes back to Robert Louis Stevenson yeah. and various eccentrics who were doing strange things in the Pyrenees back in the middle of the 19th century. Um, you know, the early mountaineers, they didn't have properly made tents. They went up to the bottom of their climb with a couple of blankets and woke up soaked with dew and freezing cold and then set off to do the first ascent of the Zmut Ridge on the Matterhorn or whatever they were after. And why the personal choice for you of going bivvying and not taking, a, say, a small tent and going camping? Well, because when you're camping, you're indoors, aren't you? You can't see anything that's going on. You do up the zip. And you might as well be at home in bed, except it's much more uncomfortable. Whereas in a bivy bag, well, not only it's lighter, and I started off wanting to be able to run over the hills and not plod up with a huge backpack. But if you're bivying, your faces aren't in the open air. You can see the stars. You can watch them rotating above your head as the night goes through. If there happens to be a, a stag, you know, just down the ridge there, standing silhouetted against the moonlit lock, well, you see the stag which you don't, of course, if you're zipped up in a tent. And you only have to open one eye to see if it's going to be cloudy and you can sleep in or whether it's going to be a beautiful sunrise and you've got to leap out and start taking pictures of it. Are you ever surprised by what you might find in the morning? Well, I once had a, a couple of robots fighting on, I, well, somewhere very close to where I was asleep. That was in the middle of the night. Yeah. It usually works the other way around. I go up there in the evening and there's an amazing view and I watch the sunset and then halfway in the night I wake up and find I'm surrounded by grey cloud with drizzle falling on my head. Oh, the, the reality, uh, I would imagine, of, of bivvying. For, for those wanting to, uh, to take their cameras and bivvy, there's, there's tech these days you can employ to give you uh, up-to-date minute-by-minute weather checks, um, apps to 
very accurately plan where to place your camera for the sunrise. Very, very expensive, super, super lightweight bags to sleep in. Tech has certainly changed the, the bivy scene, hasn't it? Well, um, a lot of that just kind of floats past me. I've been using the same bivy bag, which I think of as my new bivy bag. <laughs> um, I think I got that. It will be about 2000. It was 2002. That's right. It was the trip I did for the 200th anniversary of Coleridge's Ascent of Scorfell. So I can give you the date. It was <laughs> August 2002 when I got my new bivy bag and I'm still using that one. But it's very, it's all very lightweight, this, isn't it? I wonder how much, uh, have you ever weighed how much your entire kit um, is that you take out with you? Well, for a multi-day trip, it would be twenty-four pounds. Would be what I would aim for, 20, which is not pounds. nothing, but no. that includes camera gear and overnight gear and a bit of food. Well, let's talk about the the camera gear that you take out with you because we are a photography podcast. Um, although you, uh, you you said to me, look, I'm not really a photographer, and I countered that with, well, Ronald, I think possibly you are if you're taking a, a camera out with you and making photographs. What constitutes being a photographer? What what are the photographs you're taking these days? I, I would assume they're for the books and the studies that you do. Yeah, I'm taking photographs for walking guidebooks and for walking magazines, Mm. uh, which have specific requirements that they want a lovely picture of a mountain with a person in the corner wearing a red jacket (laughs) or an orange jacket will do at a pinch. My preferred camera is a bottom of the range digital SLR. Uh, This is a a Nikon D3200 secondhand, which cost me about £300. It's a bit heavy. I'd like to have something lighter, but it takes very nice photos to my requirements and it takes photos in raw of course because when you're not a photographer and you're always getting the white balance and the exposure and everything wrong it's a great comfort to have shot your pictures in raw where you can straighten them out afterwards uh, and what about the uh, the glass the lenses that you take with you which uh, i would imagine if you're taking nice lenses out that's that's going to add to the weight and you like to travel light, of course. I'm, I'm sorry. I just take the kit lens that came the with the camera. The kit lens that came with it. It's Fantastic. A, it's, a, it's an 18 to 55 zoom lens. Which just proves, doesn't it, that uh, a kit lens doesn't mean cheap and useless. It's uh, it's clearly something that works very well for you. Now, now in, in terms of logistics, I, I'm thinking about the, the small things that can make bivvying rather uncomfortable. I'm talking about the ticks and the mozzies and the... Uh, the midges and, and, and those nasty biting things that you will find along the track. But I, I did pick up some useful information, particularly from the, the book, where you say you need to get up high because that's where, that's where you escape those nasties. Um, yeah, it's, it's midges are the main problem when you're bivying. The horse flies go to bed at night. Um, so it takes on a problem if you're at sort of hilltop level. They mm. live in the long, juicy foliage. But yeah, with midges, it's a matter of the weather forecast. You just go up until you've got enough breeze to keep the midges away because they travel at two miles an hour maximum. So they can't get at you. If the wind's more than five miles an hour, you're safe. Oh, so the breeze is your friend. And the breeze is your friend in another way as well, because the moisture inside your bivy bag has to get out through the membrane and then evaporate off the outside. And the breeze is your friend for that as well. If you've got a very still night, you're not only going to be sort of the condensation's not going to be clear off you, but you're also going to have heavy dew in the morning. So everything's going to be damp around you when you're trying to get your socks on. Whereas if you've got a bit of a breeze, you'll not only wake up dry yourself, but with dry ground around you. I'm thinking of security now, Ronald, Um, being on your own in a bivy bag. Um, Are there there dangers? Are there things that you have to be wised up about when you... When you take just you, your camera, maybe a change of socks, uh, on onto a mountain with a bivy bag. No, I mean, there are dangers. Cows, much more dangerous than people if you're at that kind of altitude. I mean, I was a bit disturbed by these two roebucks, but they were fighting each other. They probably, well, I did. I got out of my bivy bag and dragged it down the hill into some woods where they weren't going to start fighting over the bit of ground that I was asleep yeah. on. Yeah. No, I'm not bothered by people. People are nice, friendly creatures. I mean, if I was on a 261-metre hill fort in Berkshire, I'd be worried about cows. Yeah. Some friends of mine were bothered by a hippopotamus in the night when they were wild camping, and that really is a dangerous animal. <laughs> they certainly weren't up high enough if they're being bothered by a hippo in the middle of the night. <laughs> no. So for somebody that's, that's setting out to, to do it for the first time that thinks, look, I like this idea, me, my camera my rucksack, travelling as light as I can, with a bivvy bag. What's your suggestion? How 
how do you start? You start by looking at the weather forecast and then you choose yourself a nice hill. I mean, if you're starting, you might well start from a pub. You might have an, you know, an early supper, which saves weight. Head off up the hill. You have to time it a bit carefully because if you're a proper photographer, you want this thing called the blue hour. The blue hour, yeah. I'm usually asleep during the blue hour because I like sunset and the hour before. I like the golden hour because my tastes are very simple and basic. <laughs> Uh, but if you're a real photographer, you'll be after the blue hour. Yeah. Presumably, there's another blue hour in the morning, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, there is. Right? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you look at the weather forecast, you work out which way the wind's going to be, so you try and get, you know, a bit of shelter for the wind. Yeah. And you, you're a photographer, so you've got one of these apps which tells you which direction the sun's going to be rising in. So you work out so you can have Ulls water or, you know, a, a nice sea log. Yeah. Uh, you have fun working it all out on the map, and then you get up there and you find out whether you got it right or not. Is it as much fun today as, as the first days that you strode out? I, I know it's changed, I know things have changed, I know you go for more comfort these days, but but is it as much fun? So I still get a lot of fun out of it. I can still go out and take that photograph with the mountain in the top right corner of me in the bottom left corner, and a nice light, and and be you know really happy when I come home and download the camera and there it is another mountain successfully me in the bottom right corner <laughs> the guy in silhouette on the ridge and what, what are you thinking as you look out from your bivvy I wonder what goes through Ronald, Ronald Turnbull's mind as you as you look out across these amazing views that you've written about and photographed well, I, <laughs> what I'm thinking as I lie there in my bivvy is have I already taken that photo <laughs> with the light that's developed at the moment is it worth hauling myself out and putting my boots on to take it again or should I just lie there and enjoy it that's what I'm thinking mostly so perhaps I am a photographer because I'm afraid I'm a we all do it don't we we don't look at the landscape we look in the viewfinder Ronald Turnbull and my thanks to, to Ronald look at Barkalot Barkalot come here look he's just if I kick up the leaves he's loving it Barkalot look come on you get it you get it Go on, you get it, Barkalot. He's angry with the leaves. If we could all be as amused as you, Barkalot, just kicking the leaves. Here comes another one. Look. You get it. I wonder what goes through his imagination, chasing the leaves. Anyway, my thanks to, to Ronald Turnbull and, uh, of course, for links to his work or him. And, of course, Jason from earlier and the other photographers that you've heard from or, or about today, Instagrams and the websites that we've mentioned. Go to today's show page at photographydaily.show or you can follow the link in the podcast player app that will also take you there. I'll tell you what's on, uh, on more tomorrow in a moment. Um, if you can spread the word about the podcast, I'd, uh, I'm forever grateful. Just maybe make a mention in your Facebook or or retweet the show page, or of course write to your favourite sports star by complete accident. And you never know, we might end up with a, a sports star that's uh, actually a, you know, a, a decent or, or at least interested uh, photographer at weekends when he or she is, is not playing what they play on the sports field. Right, it's that time. We've come to the, uh, the play-out song and the P.S., for the show I wish I wish I wish I could play you Art Garfunkel's Bright Eyes following our mention of Watership Down from earlier but um, but alas some rather strange or unprepared licensing laws uh, for <laughs> for podcasting they, they, they mean that I can't but having said that today's play out song I really do love and it's by Narrow Skies and it's called The River and it's a, an accompaniment really to, to both my guests today Jason because of the story from the, the River Gambia and the, the famous oyster ladies and, uh, and words from the song that certainly match his story I watched the waves of the river running wild fantastic strong and free and then Ronald Turnbull with his, uh, with his wonderful freedom roaming with his bivvy for him, uh, words of the song which, uh, which I spied too. And if I was like the mountain, I would sing to all these hills. You see, perfect for Ronald. 
Um, so the song in a moment. But in terms of uh, a postscript, I'm going to draw a quote from Watership Down for today's PS. It's not really about photography, but it is about life. So from Richard Adams, who wrote Watership Down, from the pages of a, of a book that were nearly never shared with the world, which would have been a travesty, uh, comes this, which, uh, whilst not photographic, I think you can apply entirely to what we do when we're making our pictures. Um, maybe, Richard, you were writing secretly in Watership Down a bit of a photographic manual. He wrote, There is nothing that cuts you down to size like coming to some strange and marvellous place where no one even stops to notice that you stare about you. And that's it for this week. My thanks to Jason Florio, Ronald Turnbull, the late Tom Stoddart, Jens Roda, one of our patrons, of course, and Hayley Sadler, also mpb.com, and all those who are patrons, which you can join through the link on the website, photographydaily.show. And for those wonderful supporters who are, tomorrow is The More Show. It's your own weekend oasis of a little extra for your kind support and we're going to talk about amongst other things what happened today at the end of this recording get off my land turned up yes he did and gave me a, a proper dressing down yes he did but it doesn't end quite as you may think 
What happens behind the scenes here and why hotel kettles are a problem? Left field, I know, for a photography show, but uh, as a travelling photographer, these are things you need to think about. All a bit cryptic, I'll explain tomorrow. Uh, music today from the wonderful artlist.io. Links and further research to what you've heard will be on the show page today. My thanks to Neil Ford and Emily Renier and Andrea Gilpin for helping BTS2 behind the scenes. And I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you next time. Barney's having a problem. Barney, what's the matter? What's the matter? Come here. Come here. Oh, it's the horses. You don't like the horses? Look, they look lovely. Can I get a picture of them? Yeah? Is that all right with you? He's pulling right on the end of his long extension lead. Hold on. Let me get a picture. Oh, look at you. Beautiful. Right. Starting frame from the day with the, um, the noise of Barney in the background woofing. <laughs> Shutter speed 640th. Barney, stop. F56. 160 ISO. There we go. We've got a very quaint, typical, typical English scene here. Got a lovely church in the background. We've got, got Barney there as well. Barney, stop. I'm trying to make a picture. I wanted to start this show talking about quiet and silence, and you're not really helping. Give me two seconds. Right, let's get a quick shot. This will be on the show page. Here are the horses that seem completely unbothered by Barney. Barney, you're making a an exhibition of yourself. Right, let's move on. Come on, let's move on. So I can start the show the way I was intending to. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.